All right. Welcome, everybody. We're so happy to have you here. Uh, breakout session number two. Uh, my name is Tamara Brenner. I'm executive director at the Derek Box Center for Teaching and Learning. And we are welcoming you to um, our session on improving learning by studying student learning. Okay. And um, I love the layout of this room because it makes it really easy for you to talk to each other. And we're going to be doing a fair amount of that. And so what I want you to do is actually start by talking to a partner. Um, why are you here? Meaning specifically, why did you choose to come to this session instead of any of the other three sessions right now? Um, why are you interested in spending some time thinking about studying student learning? So you've got about four minutes. Um, talk to some people at your table. All right. So I'm going to bring you back. So hopefully everybody now has met somebody at their table. Um, I, I forgot to tell you to introduce yourselves, but hopefully you all took care of that. Um, and you've got some idea of who's in the, who you're talking with. Um, OK, so um, when, when we're teaching, um, we are getting a sense of how our students are learning through various types of assessments we might get, be giving them, uh, writing papers, uh, tests, and yet, it's quite likely that you still have a lot of questions about your students' learning. What are they getting? What are they having trouble with? What kinds of misconceptions do they have? How are they approaching learning? So there, there's always questions about student learning. Um, one approach to looking at st how students learn and uh, student learning in our classrooms is called the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, which is often referred to as SOTL. Um, and this is really thinking about uh, a systematic inquiry of student learning in your own classroom. And so that's important, is that this doesn't have to be done by some outside expert, but that you as a practitioner can actually be studying student learning. And the way to think about it is that if you are a faculty member and you're doing research, scholarly research in your own field, you're going to be thinking about problems and questions. And you're going to be thinking about ways of collecting evidence and ways of interpreting evidence, uh, that evidence. And you can do the same kind of thing in your classroom. You can be asking questions about student learning and about teaching. You can be collecting evidence about student learning. And the goal here is really to improve the quality of education. So as the title is, um, we're learning about student learning for the sake of improving student learning. Okay. So uh, what we're going to be doing in this session today is we have uh, two speakers who are going to talk about some of their own experiences with collecting uh, information and uh, evidence about student learning. Um, so we have two case studies. Um, and after that, we'll be uh, doing some individual and group work thinking about how we might do some of these, these things on our own. How might we ask our own questions and start collecting some data ourselves? OK. So pleased to introduce our first speaker, uh, <laughs> uh, Enrique Besche. Um, she received her PhD in biochemistry in Germany in 2004, and since then she has been here at Harvard Medical School in cell biology, first as a postdoctoral fellow and then as a curriculum fellow. Um, when she was a curriculum fellow, she became involved with medical education and the Pathways curriculum, um, which is a flipped discussion-based curriculum la launched at the med school in 2015. Um, there uh, she's now working as Associate Director of Curriculum Integration. Um, she's teaching for three months of the year, and the rest of the time she's focused on improving the basic science of uh, curriculum across the entire four years of the MD program. I'm going to turn it over to her now. All right. Thanks, Tamara. So I'm actually teaching right now, so this is my retreat for like a day. <laughs> oh, where's the slider answer? So I'm going to give you one example. I really love uh, using data to figure out how our teaching is going. And today is uh, one story I wanted to share with you. So just to briefly give you some context, we're going to focus on teamwork. But I thought it wouldn't make much sense unless I introduced to you a little bit about what we're currently doing at the medical school. So not very long ago, um, teaching at our school simply pretty much looked like this picture from the 1940s in Albany Medical School, so lectures. Uh, lectures and, not, and more lectures. And um, if you went into a lecture hall recently, you would look down. People were on their screens, at least a third of the students doing other things, and the other two thirds were at home sleeping because they could watch that thing online later. So we realized there really wasn't much of an intellectual exchange going on that would justify to actually bring students and faculty together. So we decided to just not do that anymore, but what do you do instead? 
So instead, now we have a discussion-based uh, curriculum in these classrooms. It's actually a picture from our classrooms. You can see students sitting at these tables. Uh, you have, on this image, actually three faculty members in the room engaging with those students. So we dubbed this pedagogy CBCL, or case-based um, collaborative learning, and uh, started in 2015. So I just wanted to dissect what that means for you a little more before I dive into the teamwork. So flipped um, means students study before they come to class. Class is now mandatory for them. And it's case-based in a sense that throughout the first year of medical school, it becomes increasingly actually based on patient cases, but you could also extrapolate um, and frame it as problem-based. So we typically give them application problems that stretch and deepen the kind of content they were exposed to in the prep work. And it's collaborative. Uh, students are working in tables of four. So these tables of four are the teams I'm going to refer to throughout the presentation. And then it's discussion-based. So this discussion goes through an alternating rhythm of talking with their team, talking amongst peers back to discussion as a larger group with the faculty member. So we did this. We pretty much pulled the rug out on lectures. And as you can imagine, implementation wasn't smooth. Um, overall successful, but we definitely um, had an intense phase of learning from our students what was working and what wasn't working. And initially when we flipped, workload was a gigantic story. I mean, all these expert faculty front-loading all their expert knowledge um, was pretty much leading to prep times that were absolutely not sustainable. Case-based, it's actually not easy to decide what makes a good classroom discussion. Uh, things with yes or no answers are pretty dead the moment you ask them. So. There was a lot of work that went into, went into that. Um, not soon into the curriculum, about a year in, I started to hear a lot of students on the side talking about kind of mixed experiences in their team. So that what, that's what got started what I'm going to present today. Um, and then one big piece of focus right now is actually facilitation. So we have recently launched a peer coaching program to help faculty actually become even better facilitators. So I could talk to any of those. If anyone's interested, um, please let me know uh, after the session. But today, I'm going to focus on the teamwork with a focus on how do we get the data to actually figure out what's going on. So again, this is the CBCL classroom. And I need you to understand this scheme, uh, which is the CBCL classroom, of which we have four running uh, at the same time with around 44 or 43 students sitting at 11 tables of four. So every green square is one of these tables with four students. Um, typically, one or three faculty really depends on the course of the kind of session you run. And again, times four. So when we started out, faculty envisioned this is what it is. Everyone's green, content, happy, satisfied, <laughs> <laughs> has a great experience. In fact, we haven't given the team part any thought faculty were totally focused on content delivery. Teams, they just happen to, you know, work. Mm -hmm. um, and anecdotally, I learned that might not be the case. Uh, so in conversations with students, um, I realized some students had a terrible experience occasionally. They really were sitting with people they really didn't get along with. And then they were just sitting it out. Or they had like a so-so experience. They all had great tables. Don't get me wrong. But they all had terrible tables too. So, but the more I talk to people, the less I could put a finger on, well, is this a problem? How big is the problem? Am I making the problem up? And I certainly didn't want to make a problem up and to start bothering faculty with this is a problem if it was really like 5% of the students occasionally having a problem. So the question was, how do we measure this? So I looked in the literature and found a, lot, a nice 17 item team-based performance scale that I just ran through the class. I asked a professor to collaborate with me and we made it a assignment in one of the courses to fill out that survey with a qualitative piece to it. So there wasn't just a scale that I could turn into a number, there was also the question of what's working in the team you're currently working with and what could be improved. So I took those data and was able to piece together what you know, I roughly consider a representative image of a typical CBCL classroom with orange indicating significantly lesser of a good experience than the others sitting at your table. So I'm looking for a gap in experience. I can't fully judge it, but there's a gap, there was a gap in how these individuals rated that experience. The orange squares signify people that had a lower performing team experience. And you'd find these asymmetric tables with one person kind of feeling isolated in their experience and just said, this isn't working for me, but <coughs> the other three people had a reasonably good time. You see uh, split tables with a couple of people feeling great and the other two often feeling excluded. 
And then at occasionally you'd see this big orange blob, which is what I call a toxic table, <laughs> with cognitive biases, you know, emotions running really high, like really bad stuff happening that didn't seem conducive to learning. So that's where we arrived. But then I was really happy I made the decision to not just ask, you know, about those quantifiable questions, but also ask what was working, what was not working. Because what I needed to know, what would it take to make this better? So um, this is what I learned from reading those comments. Um, so I did a pretty brief uh, qualitative type of analysis. And three big domains stood out to me. It was emotions. How did you feel in that team? It was whether or not that team had a way of working together, kind of process, and how they actually talked to each other, how they communicated. And so in a good team, in a good classroom experience, they felt safe and valued. Often they would actually have a process to go around and elicit everyone's ex opinion explicitly. So they were not just haphazardly talking at each other, they were systematic about it. Another big thing is respecting that everybody thinks at a different pace. So they were actually adamant about giving each other that space to think quietly before starting to talk. Or they would use different methods. They wouldn't just talk, but they would draw things out um, on boards and such. And that kind of process also seemed to help with valuing everyone's opinion. So it's not like they asked everyone to say something they also valued and truly listened, didn't interrupt. Um, and uh, in that process, we're able to emphasize the reasoning and push for deeper thinking. So the orange people described a very different experience. So often that orange uh, color is associated with feeling outright dismissed and unsafe. Um, they complained about side conversations that made them feel excluded. They complained about a lack of process. So it was just pure chaos unfolding at these tables. Uh, too much focus um, on the correct answer. What, and med, med students have this famous expression of a Ghana mentality. So that seemed to come out in some people at these tables. Answers blurted out without any consideration of where others were in the thinking process. Lack of discourse reasoning. And um, just not being heard. Some, some person dominating at these tables were common um, complaints. So Maybe that's not surprising, right? We've all had experiences of coworkers that we just can't stand and meetings that, you know, if we have to sit with that person, it's just a nightmare. That's fine, people will be people, but I did want to know, is there something we can do about it? Because I strongly felt that, well, maybe we just need to tell them how to work together. Maybe they need to know um, that you need a process. Maybe that's a thing, and if we tell them, it gets better. So we're telling them that now. That's not the question I just, I tested. Um, we're giving them the information that I just showed you and feed them forward right now. But at that time, I just said, okay, why don't we give them some time to um, just talk about how it's going, how they want to work together. So we gave them the time. I found another course to collaborate with, and they got 20 minutes to, at the beginning of their team work, to talk to each other how they want to work together, and another 20 minutes of a week or so later to talk about how it was going and make adjustments. And that simple act of giving them time led from what we looked at here, which was uh, the end status of teams after four weeks in the course without any consideration to the team process, it turned into this. Um, so just to make sure you understand, these are different teams. It's not a controlled experiment. Um, but with those additional two times 20 minutes, they were able to overall come out just simply looking like they were getting along better. And I'm not showing that here, but it's not just that we prevent toxic teams potentially by this, but the okay functioning teams actually became high functioning teams as well. So also the green isn't just green, there are shades of green, um, data I'm not presenting here. So I'm calling this by intervention group, but in an experimental design kind of sense, there is no control here. So to translate that back to what we're doing at HMS, so there's more that went into this, but it led me to conclude that what we can do for our CBCL classrooms is maybe formally create times for teams to set norms and give each other feedback as just standard part of the curriculum. To um, now I want to pilot peer feedback. Maybe that's something we can fold into this and further enhance communication and interpersonal skill building, which is something that I'd be excited to do, but we'd also give them maybe a more you know, bigger context for that, give them a little more knowledge about uh, where this is all coming from. So if you thought this is interesting, 
that's great, I do too, and I love this project, <coughs> but that's actually not what I wanted to talk about with you in a sense. What I hope you would realize is that this is actually an example of how you can use the mind frame of quali continuous quality improvement to drive what you do in the classroom. So I've been a scientist for the better part of my adult life, and I miss the scientist, and I'm very data-driven, but I've always been hindered by hypothesis-driven research because it ends you in a position where you have to have this control group and it's very limiting and doing educational research in a way that you have that perfect control group and you have that hypothesis, it often just doesn't fit into real life and you can't withhold entire pieces of instruction from half of the class and then give it to others and then <laughs> test them on the same thing. So um, what I hope you can acknowledge is that in this scenario we moved from a curriculum with lectures and no consideration of teamwork to something where we had active learning and some teams but no framework to collaboration and teamwork is actually a program objective of the medical degree, which I found out later, so it fits nicely. <laughs> it gives me a lot of leverage. So I now aim to make it active skill building and peer feedback really be an integrated part of the curriculum and who knows where that leads me. So this is the framework of continuous quality improvement. You're driving change. You're driving that boulder up the hill, telling people Peer feedback is a great thing. Three years ago, every medical student was running away from me if I mentioned that in the hallway. And faculty were dismissing me saying, oh gosh, who wants to deal with that? That's going to be a social kind of nightmare. So you're not only learning what your students might need, you're also educating students and faculty at the same time. So there's a dualism. So just to compare, compare this to research, so QI is not hypothesis driven. It's just about how is this going, how we can make it better. And it frees you of these limitations that often research brings in terms of um, experimental design. You can do it in a more incremental fashion that I drive this in a kind of yearly rhythm. I figure out what next piece can I work out in the next six or eight or nine months. While research, I think, has a lot of benefit, but um, I found this framework really liberating. So this wouldn't be possible without some of the people in the room. Um, there's the Office of actually educational quality improvement that was just founded at HMS, uh, which was seen Amy Sullivan, Barbara Cockwell, John Dalrymple, Carolyn over there, and Steve were in that office and have helped me out with this. And then at Hanard is our dean, who's really a champion for data-driven um, improvement of teaching, and Randall King is my long-term collaborator. Thank you. All right, so we have time for one or two questions. Any questions for Enrique? Oh, when we changed the curriculum? I wasn't at the very initial meetings. I was part of a committee that created one of the larger courses in the curriculum. And I think there was an executive decision being made at a higher level um, that we're going to go through with this. And at the time, I thought, this is never going to work. They didn't give us any instructions because they said, we're going to go flip, do something discussion-based, but there wasn't like, do this. There was no information how we were supposed to do this. In retrospect, I thought that was ingenious because when the faculty got together to get concretely going, to say how are we going to change our course, there was a lot of deliberation in the room, but we still had the freedom to make it our own in the process. And there was a lot of whining about letting go and fear. But overall, I think some form of demanding change but then giving people creative freedom made it work. But as I said, I wasn't at those, when that decision was made to really go ahead, I wasn't there for that. All right, one more question. How are the original groups formed? Oh, yeah, we just assign them. <laughs> and then we rotate them and permutate them throughout the year. Do you ever consider not doing that? I, I would go as far as considering that, but I think that is too early in this process. I think we should have longer teams and give them more support to emotionally grow in those teams. Right now, I think the most I can ask is for four months. And I'm making inroads on longer teams. But I know of one team-based curriculum at the School of um, and it's Charlestown Institute of Health Professions. They have a 14 months team BL curriculum. And they lock those in on day one. And then they have a mediator to help teams that run into a conflict they can resolve on their own. All right. Thank you very much, Enrique. All right, next up we have David Lavari. He finished his PhD in psychology in 2018, 
um, here at Harvard. Um, he was working with Daniel Gilbert. Um, he's now a postdoctoral research associate Har at Harvard Business School, working primarily with Michael Norton. Um, while he was a PhD student here at Harvard, he also worked with the Block Center for Teaching Learning as a departmental teaching fellow, um, and he worked with us as a co-author on our uh, relatively new online course that's a collaboration with HarvardX and Get Smarter on um, uh, strategies for online teaching and learning. Or not, not online teaching and learning. It's an online course on teaching and learning. Oh. All right, I'll turn it over to David now. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the research I do. I'm a social psychologist. I run studies. And uh, the research I'm going to talk about was actually funded by HILT. So if you think it's neat and you want to do something like it, or you hate it and you want to do the opposite, <laughs> apply for funding from HILT. They're great. They fund a lot of <laughs> cool projects about uh, education and research. OK. Um, so I want to start you off uh, by talking about some ads you may have seen. Uh, maybe on the internet or on Facebook for this company called Masterclass. Their whole pitch is that you can learn how to do something from the best. Pick a topic like cooking and you can, for a small fee, get video instruction from luminaries in that field. Like here you could take a cooking lesson <coughs> from uh, Wolfgang Puck, a very famous chef. Um, and I just want you to imagine uh, a hy hypothetical situation that I give you the choice of uh, paying that fee to get a cooking lesson from Wolfgang Puck or the same cooking lesson from this guy. <laughs> so, you know, it's not a hard question. And I think the reason it's not a very difficult question to answer is that we have an intuition that in a lot of domains, um, all else being equal, the better someone is at something, the more they have to teach, and maybe the more effective they'll be at teaching you how to do that thing. Uh, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Uh, what are the limits of that intuition? When is it wrong? And kind of what are the consequences of it? Um, so, uh, a roadmap of some of the things I'm going to try to convince you of. Uh, we often think that top performers in a domain are going to be the best instructors in that domain, but that's often not true. And uh, maybe part of the reason we think that, even though it's not often true, uh, is that top performers do teach in a way that seems, just sounds very different from how other people tend to give instruction. And again, I'm a social psychologist, so the way I do this is um, I take a lot of people and I put them in a situation and see what decisions they make. Um, so we tried to kind of make a situation in which we could examine uh, how people teach and learn and how that relates to their performance. Uh, so what type of teaching did I want to study? Um, there's a lot of different types of teaching. Uh, because it's kind of easy to implement in this research design, I wanted to look at the type of teaching that answers the question, how do I get better at something, right? So think of a tutor, think of a coach, think of peer instruction in the classroom. You're asking your, uh, the person next to you how to do better on a problem set. It's teaching that's aimed to get you more proficient at something. And you can think of it as just teaching that hopefully if it works well leads to improvements in performance at whatever task you're doing. Um, so the way we would study that is pretty straightforward. We would take a bunch of people, we would get their baseline performance in whatever task we're interested in. Then we would give them advice, which is just what I'm calling the type of instructions we're giving them and the teaching they get about the task. And then we measure how they do again later uh, after that instruction. So we're going to see if the uh, teaching they got helped them do better at the task. Pretty straightforward, right? We used a bunch of different types of tasks when we were studying this stuff. I'm just going to talk about one, which is Boggle. If you don't know about Boggle, it's a great game. You have a grid of letters, and you have to find uh, as many words as you can in the grid in a short amount of time. So uh, in this grid, here's the word ride, here's kite, here's the word sour, and you usually have a time limit. So we might give people 60 seconds to find as many words as they can. Um, and the first thing we kind of wanted to do uh, is basically interrogate that intuition I started with, which is saying that, oh, people think the better you are at something, the better you'll do at teaching that. Maybe people don't think that's true, at least with this task. We wanted to kind of double check. Uh, so what we did is I took 800 uh, people in an online survey, and I had them play Boggle just to get a sense of what the game is like in case they hadn't played before. And then they answered a question about who they'd want to be taught by in the game. Um, so we asked a bunch of different ways, but one version of the question basically said, if you could pick someone to teach you how to play this game, ranging from the very worst player to the very best player, who would you pick? Uh, on this graph, the x-axis is the percentile of performance people chose, and the y-axis is how uh, often they chose it. And you can see the overwhelming preferences. People want to be taught by the very best player they have access to. Another way of asking the question, you can split performance into kind of deciles, so the top 10% of players, the bottom 10%, all the ones in the middle, and just ask, if you were going to be taught by someone who was this good, how helpful would that be? And you see this pretty strong linear relationship. The better people are at the game, the better other people predict that they're going to teach us how to play. So was that true, at least for this game? 
Um, so what we did was we got a bunch of teachers, we got 78 new people online to play this game a bunch of times, and then they wrote advice about this game. Basically, they wrote a little lesson, here's something I'm gonna write for someone that's gonna help them learn how to be better at the game. And then we took 1,500 new people and gave them that advice. Each student got advice from one teacher. And then we had 600 people as a control who didn't get any advice, because we just wanted to make sure that this is the kind of game where being taught helps <coughs> at all. If it doesn't, then we're not gonna be able to learn anything from our study. Um, from the perspective of the students, here's what the study looked like. So you play the game once, that's your baseline performance before you get taught. Then you get some advice, that's the teaching. And then you play a bunch more times. And the way we measured your improvement is we would just average together all of the times you played after you were taught, and then subtract from that your baseline performance. So that difference is kind of us measuring, did the teaching have any impact on how well you did at the game? In other words, was the teaching effective? Um, I won't really go through this, but people gave really diverse types of advice about the game. Think small. All the words are worth one point. Don't focus on long words. Use plurals. Look at the whole puzzle. Don't go letter by letter. There were a lot of different strategies people used. It was really diverse types of strategies people used to teach. It wasn't the type of task where there was just one secret to success, which is, I think, kind of how real learning works, right? There's not just one way to do a lesson plan. Uh, OK, so uh, first, I'm not really going to go through this, but we did double check that, yes, getting taught in this game was better than not getting taught. So the blue bar, people who got taught how to play the game did better than people who didn't. So this was the type of task where being taught helped, which is good. Um, then this next graph I'm going to show you is the important one. So the x-axis here is how skilled your teacher was at the game. And the y-axis is how much better you did at the game after you were taught. And it's kind of hard to parse out this big scatter plot, but I'll draw a helpful line for it. <laughs> and what you see is basically that, it, at least in this game, there was no relationship between how skilled your teacher was at playing this game and how helpful their teaching was for you to learn how to play the game better. In other words, if you were a student um, and you were trying to pick an instructor to help you play this game, you would have been as well off on average picking the very worst player to teach you as the very best player. It would have, wouldn't have made a difference in your performance. Uh, and so it's not just about the actual in relationship between performance and uh, teaching in this case. People also predicted that it would turn out this way. So the teachers, when you ask them, the red line here, how helpful is your teaching going to be? The better the teachers were on the x-axis at playing this game, the more helpful they thought that their advice was going to be. The better teachers they thought they would be, they were more confident. And same thing with the students. After they got their lesson, we asked them, hey, did your, how much was it helpful to get that advice that you got from one of the previous players in the game? And what you see is whether they were answering the question, how helpful was the teacher, or how much did I improve? The more skilled that their teacher was, the more that these students felt like they improved. Even though, again, the graph I showed you earlier showed there wasn't actually a relationship. So both the teachers and the students thought that better performers were doing better teaching here, even though that didn't seem to be the case. So, at least in this task, Actual advice efficacy, uh, teaching performance, wasn't correlated with the uh, performance in this game, but both the teachers and the students thought it was. Um, why? So I don't really have a lot of time to go into this, but um, our initial investigations seem to suggest that the biggest difference we can find between the way that the top performers teach and the bottom performers in this game teach, the difference between their advice is that better performers just give a lot more of it. So somebody who's very bad at this game might give you like two tips on how to do better, and someone who's great might give you ten. And people read the 10 tips and go, wow, this is so helpful. But they don't do any better than the people who just got two. Uh, OK, I kind of already went through these takeaways. Um, some consequences of what I just told you, at least what I think. So one suggestion, if this extends to actual classroom stuff, is that we might sometimes be overvaluing top performers as teachers, right? Um, a lot of times, I think that the heuristic that students and you know people making hiring decisions use to choose teachers is, is this person really good at the thing they're teaching? And this suggests not that they're bad at it. I think, if anything, our society has way too much devaluing of experts these days in general, but that we might be undervaluing the uh, teaching ability of people who aren't at the very pinnacle of, of doing the thing that they're teaching, right? Um, and that is partly a problem because we don't always have uh, efficient matching between students and teachers. Good teachers are in short, short supply, high demand. So if there's this wellspring of great instructors who are kind of being overlooked because they don't have the best grades or the best scores or the best track record of doing the thing they're teaching, um, we should take another look at that. And I think it's important to remember that just like playing boggle is a skill, you know, being a surgeon is a skill, being an athlete is a skill, teaching is a skill. And it would be kind of ridiculous to expect somebody who's a world-class tennis player to also be a classical pianist. And in the same way, why should you expect that the very best teachers that are out there waiting for you to find them 
also have to be the very best at doing the things they're teaching. Um, I'll just zoom out for one second and say that uh, I think of this as kind of a one example of a broader phenomenon in psychology research called the curse of knowledge, which is just about how when you know something, um, it's difficult to put yourself in the perspective of people who don't know that thing, right? Uh, one example that people use in studies a lot is if I tap a song on the table that I'm thinking of in my head, I know exactly what the song is and it seems obvious to me, but you might have no idea what that song was. That was the Star Spangled Banner. Um, <laughs> and thinking of ways to kind of implement this principle in the classroom, um, a, a professor in the psychology department I've taught with, Fiery Cushman, has a great technique he's used called a mirroring exercise. Um, some of you may have heard of it, where basically uh, students take samples of their own writing, like if they're working on a draft of an essay, and they just read it aloud to a partner. And their partner, all they can do is just regurgitate back exactly what they've heard and like summarize it. This is what you just read to me. And you'd be amazed at how much these students think the ideas are so crystal clear in my head. And as soon as they have to just read them on the page to someone else, um, they realize how far they have to go to kind of bridge the gap between their mind and other students' minds. Um, so hopefully you can think about how that principle applies to your own teaching and how you think about teaching in general. And thank you very much. All right, a couple questions for David. Yes, if, do, uh, my intuition is that as much as this makes sense, I wonder how it applies to the, the, in the teaching and learning space of how we teach teachers. Because my intuition is that people who are bad at teaching are, well, that it's a, a, that you have to be good at teaching to be good at teaching people how to teach. Whoa. So I, <laughs> that's like, do you have intuitions about that? So my intuition, again, matches exactly what everybody predicted in the yeah. study and what you're articulating, which is that yes, somebody who, unless somebody is a rock star in the classroom and either has a ton of experience or a natural ability to kind of engage their students and get the most out of them, how can they teach me how to improve my own teaching? <laughs> and yet, I will say that um, I was involved in pedagogy instruction in the psychology department, and uh, oftentimes, you know, what that is, is it's a bunch of graduate students giving each other feedback and workshopping their own teaching. They're often teachers for the first time. We also have faculty come in who are teachers with years of experience, some of them very popular, some of them less popular, giving feedback and suggestions. And a lot of the most valuable feedback I would see didn't come from the people I would consider the, the best teachers there were. So it's certainly, I, I don't want your takeaway from this to be that good, good teachers don't or good people, people who are good at doing things, whether that's teaching or something else, don't teach that thing well, but that the other people might surprise you. And that, so we should solicit feedback, for example, about teaching, not just from the rock star teachers, but from everybody else too. And just as a suggestion, maybe one reason is that people who have, for example, been really successful teachers their whole life might not be as familiar with some of the challenges and struggles you can have in a classroom if you're a less confident teacher. Whereas someone who's had a lot of trouble, they can be like, you know, I also froze up when I had to speak in front of people, or I never quite knew how to manage that discussion. Um, they're kind of tapping into different realms of knowledge. And maybe that's part of why they can sometimes be more effective than we expect, at least that's what this suggests. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in this notion that you can't expect um, like the top tennis player to also be a, like a concert pianist. And so one might then apply that to an R1 research institution saying that we might have research faculty and teaching faculty, which is a somewhat controversial idea around here. So one of your thoughts on, I mean, do, do you think that's a leap too far or is, are you nudging in that direction? I think that it kind of depends on what your goals are. So if your goals are to have a curriculum and a kind of uh, program in which you're giving the students the best possible experience, then that would argue strongly in favor of what you're suggesting, at least that's where my research leads me to conclude, and that you wanna, you, you can't have it both ways and try to slice the pie and find the people who are the top, top researchers and the top, top teachers without sacrificing something in both directions. There just aren't enough people out there who are amazing at both, and you're kind of leaving people by the wayside who are good at one but not the other. That being said, it seems like the students and the teachers all were very happy with their experience when they were taught by the, the great professors, so to speak, <laughs> in our studies. So, um, Unless you're in a situation, I think, where you can really clearly measure the learning outcomes and then compare that to how it would be if you changed up the, the teaching staff, I, I think it's hard to kind of make the argument for a dramatic change. And that kind of, you know, it's just hard to measure these things in a higher education setting. But um, yeah, I think any, even short of that, I think any ways to kind of bring more and focus more on great teaching in an R1 institution, uh, 
can only be for the better. All right, one more question and then we'll move on. Uh, I have a question. So, like, if I'm a, a volleyball player in the second uh, um, best volleyball, it, might it be, it, it, does your research show, like, am I going to learn better from somebody that might be in the fourth versus somebody that's in the ninth or tenth? I was sure that this would, so just if people didn't follow that, I was sure that this would be the case, that it wouldn't just be the case that um, you as a student would learn well from somebody who was uh, at the very bottom of performance compared to the very top, compared to the middle. I was sure that what would really be going on is that the best thing, the optimal thing, would be that you would learn from somebody a little bit better than you or a little bit worse than you, or there would be some critical distance of performance between you and your teacher that would lead to the best outcomes. I looked and I looked and I couldn't find it in this data. Again, this is a very abstract toy study with games. Who knows how it relates to uh, outcomes in the actual classroom. And I wouldn't be surprised if that type of gap uh, uh, comes more into play in those situations, but I didn't find it here. It's a great question. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, David. All right, so we just heard two very different kinds of examples of ways that you can go about studying learning. One looking at tr really trying to figure out what is going on in my classroom with my students, another looking in more of a research study, um, e experimental situation. Um, I'm going to give you two more examples of uh, ways that my people might think about studying learning, um, and then we'll get into trying to ask some of our own questions. Okay, so. Here is our image again, the one that Enrique actually didn't want to talk about. <laughs> um, so uh, this is an example of, of some work done by Peter Felton, who is a historian and director of Center for Teaching and Learning at Elon University. Um, so he's a historian, and he was had given his students lots of text to analyze, and then he started giving his students um, visual data. And for a while, he just assumed that they know what to do with it and how to make sense of it, and then he started questioning that. Um, and so to try to figure out where his students were at, he created some in-class activities. Um, and in these in-class activities, he gave them a series of uh, images, uh, visual images, um, and had them answer certain questions about what do you think is the meaning of this image, uh, where did it come from, et cetera, et cetera. And he also asked them questions about if I gave you a list of different uh, s sources of historical information, how would you value these historical sources? And based on these types of questions, he actually got a lot of insights about how his students thought about historical data, or not historic, about uh, different types of data, and in particular how they were interpreting visual data, things that he didn't realize. And based on what he learned from these studies, it actually changed his teaching, and he introduced new types of assignments to uh, help his students understand how to deal with visual data. Okay. All right. So um, uh, another. Um, way you might go about uh, studying learning. What if you have a question about, um, I have created this new online module to help my students and my chemistry class understand topic A. Okay, so what's an approach you could take for that? You can imagine that you give your students a pretest on topic A, um, and then you break the students in half, and half of the students have access to this online module, and half of the students uh, have some access to other types of materials, maybe reading materials on this topic, <laughs> but not the online module. And then they might have a post-test, and you can see how much they learned about particular this topic uh, based on exposure to the, uh, this online module. And you might also give them uh, some survey questions about their attitudes and their experience with this module. Okay, so this is a, an example where it's more on the experimental side. Um, you have a, a control group, um, you have a pretest, you have a post-test, you're also assessing attitudes. Um, so as Enrique very nicely described to us, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about student learning. Um, and the first uh, example here, as Enrique uh, talked about, um, is more, is I think in many ways easier to implement in your authentic classroom setting of you don't have to be uh, breaking your students into control groups and having them have different uh, educational experiences. Um, in the second case, you need to be going through IRB appro approval to uh, be thinking about your students as subjects. So there's a lot of different things to be thinking about as you want to uh, study student learning. Just, just wanted to get a range of ideas out there. Okay, so um, if you want to think about what's going on in your own classroom, um, you might w what you want to do is you want to first start by identifying a problem and generating a question. And so you want to think about a question that is relevant and meaningful to you. Something that is something that you could actually study with the students that you work with. And that the focus of this 
is, relevant, is something that you actually can tackle in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and I think those are think types of concerns Enrique actually addressed very nicely. Okay, um, so people who are thinking about SOTL, the scholarship of teaching and learning, um, I have broken these types of questions into a number of different categories. And I'm gonna just raise two of them because I think that they're the easiest to start with. And one is types of questions about what is. So these are types of questions that are seeking to describe student learning or teaching approaches. Just get a better understanding of where your students are at, what's happening, and so on. And another type of uh, question is what works? And these are uh, types of studies where you're seeking evidence for the effectiveness of a teaching strategy. Okay, okay. so wh what you're gonna do now um, is first I want you to think about who your audience is. So some of you might be thinking about students who you teach directly. But I also know that some people in this room are academic professionals who might be working with faculty or with graduate students um, and helping other folks like that with their teaching. And so in that case, you might be thinking about uh, students in a course that you support, but maybe that you don't teach directly. Or you might be thinking about um, your audience might actually be the faculty or the grad graduate student clients whom you work with. Okay? So, um, what you're gonna do is think about what is a question about their learning that you'd like to explore. So on your table, you will find a one-page handout. And so you can uh, work on this one-page handout. It specifically asks the same question. And take maybe two minutes to write down a question and then take another two minutes to talk with the neighbor to share your questions with each other. Okay, so first, question, first step is identifying a question that you care about about student learning. And of course, our next question, next step is that we need to think about gathering evidence. Okay. And there's a lot of different forms that evidence can come in, and I'm gonna go through a few. Um, first, you can think about ways of collecting direct, direct evidence about student learning. So this is asking questions directly about what did the students learn. And you might do this through samples of student work. You might be looking very carefully at a particular responses to a particular essay prompt. You might be looking carefully at a set of quiz questions on a topic that you care about. Um, you might be looking at how the students created concept maps. Um, maybe you're looking at student responses to a minute paper where they answer questions about what was the most important thing you learned today and what questions do you still have. Um, there's all sorts of types of formative in-class assessments that you might analyze, also all different types of student work. Um, you might be making observations of students. If you want to be studying group work, you might, uh, in addition to doing surveys, you might have other ways of actually observing what they're doing in their groups. Um, you might collect students' reflections themselves on their own values, their attitudes, their beliefs. There's also indirect evidence about student learning. So what do students report that they learned? And this might be collected through surveys or interviews, where students are reflecting on their learning or about their satisfaction with the learning experience. Um, you might also include reflections by instructors about what their observations are of student learning. And as you're gathering different types of evidence, you can think about uh, both quantitative approaches. So for example, if you're doing a survey, you might have uh, questions with Likert scales where you have a numerical responses. Um, you might be also looking at qualitative approaches. So if you're doing, you might be doing interviews and focus groups where you might be getting more nuanced type of data. Okay, so this is to give you the sense that there's a lot of different approaches that you can use to collect evidence about student learning. Um, I also want you to realize that um, beyond, so there are certainly gonna be cases where you are studying student work, and this is gonna be very specific to what is happening in your classroom with assignments that you've created, but there's also a lot of tools out there that you can take advantage of. You don't need to continually be reinventing the wheel for everything. Um, so uh, there are ways, there are a lot of tools out there for assessing student learning or knowledge. Um, a couple of examples, there's something called the AACU value rubrics, um, which are some excellent tools. They're not assessments per se, but they're rubrics for, uh, that have been created in a lot of different categories of competencies that are valuable um, for students to be learning in higher education. Um, and then it, there are a lot of uh, concept inventories, particularly in the sciences, uh, which are very well validated instruments uh, looking at whether students have learned key concepts in different fields. So these are things that you can look up for your field. Um, and then there's a lot of scales that are, are basically um, sets of questions that are gonna get at 
students, a lot of different uh, attributes of students. Students' academic self-efficacy. What is their belief and their confidence in their ability to succeed in academics? Um, students' critical thinking, their motivation, uh, their metacognition, so their ability to reflect on their own learning. Um, there are scales about student strategies for learning, student study behaviors, and much more. Okay, so those are some examples. Um, I put a reference that's on the bottom of your handout um, of this uh, booklet called The Compendium of Scales for the Use in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning that has lots and lots of examples and references for scales that might be useful. Okay, so now what I want you to do is you've got an overview of types of strategies that you might use for studying student learning. And what I want you to do is in a small group, and what does a small group mean? I'm gonna let you choose whether at your table it's best to work in a group of uh, two or three. Um, you can divide yourselves uh, as you wish. So maybe groups of two, maybe groups of three. If you're at a table of four, that's also okay. Um, so you were, you were just starting to share your questions Choose one of your questions to focus on for the rest of this activity, okay? And once you've chosen that question, start brainstorming some approaches that you could take to go about answering that question, okay? So we're gonna take about um, seven minutes to do this. So in a small group, pick a question and brainstorm some strategies to answer that question. Has everyone figured it out? You've got some approaches? Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'd love to hear from some of you. Share with each other what you've been thinking about. So what was your, what question are you interested in and what were some approaches you took? And so on the bottom of your handout, there are uh, links to a couple of great websites with information about scholarship of teaching and learning. Also, before you walk out, there's a um, stapled handout on every, for each of you. Um, these are pages for, that a group at Vanderbilt University Center for Teaching put together about scholarship of teaching and learning, um, and a lot of great information about how to start thinking about a problem and how to go about collecting evidence. All right, thank you very much. Lunch is downstairs.